And what I want to encourage you with this morning is be careful not to settle for a barnyard living at the price of soaring into your destiny. Because everything that the world offers at its best is still a barnyard. So the best comfort, it's still a barnyard. The best conveniences, it's still a barnyard. All the, the, the materialism that you can put your hands on, it's still but a barnyard. And too many folks are settling for barnyard living instead of living for their mission and walking into their destiny. I want to show you this morning, and we're going to talk this morning. I hope you all excited because I'm ready this morning. We're going to talk a little bit this morning about a man who actually got off mission and why he got off mission to find out, well, what is it that could actually get me off the mission that God has for me? Then we're going to find out what does God have to say when we get off mission? What does he have to say about that? And the third thing is what does it take for us to get back on mission? I don't know about y'all, but have you ever settled in a place that you knew you shouldn't have settled in? I, I thought as I was preparing for this message, I began to think about when we were in New York and the Lord had called us here. And I knew he called us here. But it became really challenging to make the move. And a lot of things, a lot of dynamics were at play. And I can remember saying, we, we're just going to stay right here. Then we had a good friend of ours who said to us, and I would have said the same thing to her if the shoe was on the foot. She said, can't y'all just plant a, a church here in New York? Basically, she didn't want us to move because, you know, we were close and we were good friends with her and her family. She said, can't y'all just plant? I mean, you got all your connections in here. You know, you got a, a, amazing jobs and other job offers. Why can't you just plant? And I look back now, it'll be 30 years next year, and I look back now and I said, wow, thank you, God, that I didn't settle for the barnyard. So let's look at a man who did settle and why he settled and then see what it means for us. Are y'all ready? Are you really ready? Yeah. All right, here we go. Genesis eleven twenty six says this. After Terah had lived 70 years, he became the father of Abram, Nahor, and Haran. I'm going to use the name Abraham. That's his original name before God changed it. This is the account of Terah's family. Terah came, became the father of Abram, Nahor, and Terah. And, and a Haran became the father of Lot. While his father Terah was still alive, Haran died in Ur of the Chaldeans in the land of his birth. Abram and Nahor both married. The name of Abram's wife was Sarai, or Sarah, and the name of Nahor's wife was Milcah. She was a daughter of Haran, the father of both Milcah and Eskel. Now Sarai was childless because she was not able to conceive. <coughs> Excuse me. Terah took his son Abram, his grandson Lot, son of Haran, and his daughter-in-law Sarai, the wife of his son Abram, and together they set out. Somebody said together they set out. Together they set out from Ur to, of the Chaldeans to go to Canaan. Canaan is the land of promise. But when they came to Haran, they settled there. Terah lived 205 years, and he died in Haran. I'm going to read from Acts chapter 7, and I'll bring it together later on. This is in the New Testament being preached. It says, The God of glory appeared to our father Abraham while he was still in Mesopotamia, that's Ur, before he lived in Haran. Leave your country and your people, God said, and go to the land I will show you. So he left the land of the Chaldeans and settled in Haran. After the death of his father, God sent him to this land, this is where they're preaching at, where you are now living. Let's talk just a bit this morning. Let me just give you some background about what's happening here. So you can see that we started off in Genesis chapter 11. I briefly talked about last week or touched on the idea. We talked about uh, be a man being on a mission and we talked about sometimes the thing that keeps us from being on a mission is that we can be that we can find ourselves building monuments to ourselves what I want to also take you back to Genesis is this that not only was or let me rephrase this not only are men called to be on mission but our father God our father him, he himself was on mission if you remember Genesis chapter 3 there was the fall of man, but there was one promise and there was a glimmer of hope that came in it. And it was real simple when he said, but profound, when he said the seed of the woman will crush the head of the serpent. And how many of y'all know that seed of the woman is Jesus Christ ultimately? And he crushed the head of the serpent on the cross. But it's interesting because from Genesis chapter 3, you see God take a very active role in redemption. In redemption. And so 
the, the challenge that we see is that even though man had fallen away from God, God had never given up on mankind. And so God was always after somebody that would help him. He was looking for a man to help bring his plan of redemption into the earth. And so despite all of the grace and the goodness of God, what we find man doing in the beginning of Genesis is what he did in Genesis chapter 3. He's falling further and further into sin. So we talked last week about the Tower of Babel, and it was man's idea of how he can be as great as God or as big as God or, and that kind of thing. We constantly see this thing happening. But after all of that, men still wax in sin, and then a guy named Noah comes along. Y'all know who I'm talking about? How many of y'all know that the rainbow belonged to the covenant that came through Noah? How many of y'all know that? Let's keep that clear in Pride Month, right? And so the rainbow, he says, I'm not going to destroy the earth again. He says, he says but that rainbow is going to be a sign of my covenant with man because ultimately God is after reconciliation with man. However, men became sinful and evil again, right? And it leads us to where we are. And where we find ourselves here when we talk about Tira's story is Tira's story is like an epic, well, let me say it this way. Tira's story is sort of sad. It's, it's stuck between two epic biographies. You have the biography of Noah, where he's talking about all this great feat that Noah did that in spite of everybody else going the wrong way, God speaks to Noah and he builds an ark to the saving of his family. That's an epic story. Then you go to Genesis chapter 12. There's another epic story. It takes chapters and chapters and chapters to unfold because God has chosen a man. His name is Abraham. And God said, I'm going to use your, I'm going to use your line, your family, and out of your family, Jesus Christ is ultimately going to be born. Are you with me this morning? And here we have Terah, and Terah is Abraham's father. His story, his biography is stuck between Noah and Abraham. And I've read all of that extra stuff about Terah, not because I'm preaching about all how the relations and who's related and why he married. I wanted to show you that Terah's story is stuck. Seven sentences, seven verses between two epic stories because Terah settled. God speaks to Terah. Or speaks to Abraham. We know he definitely spoke to Abraham before they left Mesopotamia, before they left Ur, and says to go to Canaan. He tells them, essentially, God said, I want you to move from where you are to where I'm sending you because I want to start something different in your family. Let me stop right here real quick. God is still looking for a man today to start something different in your family. God is still looking for a man today to break generational curses. God is still looking for a man today to bridge the gap between sinners and saints. God is still looking for a man today to apply the blood of Jesus to his lineage. God is still looking for a man today to raise up Christian men that love Jesus with all. So God is still looking for a man today to make his name great in the earth. God is still on a mission looking for a man. And he tells Tira, I want to invite you to be part of my mission. I want to bring you into my story. I want to bring you into a story that will outlast your lifetime. So what I need you to do is get up, get your family, get out of Ur, and get to Canaan. But the Bible says that he left, he set out. Scripture says he set out to go to Canaan, but he settled in Ur. He set out to go to Canaan, but he settled in there. How many times do we set out for one thing, but settle for another? Oh, y'all ain't going to talk. We set out to be the head, but settle to be the tail. Come on. We set out to be holy, but end up being unholy. Y'all ain't going to say, we set out, we come to the altar because we want God to change our life, but we accept our first life instead of our new life in Christ. We set out, but we settle. We, we set out to be an entrepreneur, but we end up being on a job for 35 years. We set out to pass down generational blessings, but pass down diabetes. We set out to be spiritual and settle being carnal. And so the question is, why did Tira settle? Why are we reading seven verses that bookmark a man's whole life? 
and not reading Genesis 12 about Tyr and Genesis 13. Because in Abraham, Abraham's in 12, 13, 14, 15, 16, 17, 18, 19, 20. And then he's quoted throughout the whole Bible or referred to throughout the whole Bible through the New Testament. Why are we reading about Tyr in seven verses? What caused a man that could have been so much more to settle for so much less? Joshua answers the question for us. Just listen. And I quote Joshua 24, 2 says, Tira, the father of Abraham and Nahor, served other gods. Served other gods. And the word served there can also be translated as worked. So, hence the tradition in the Jewish culture that Tira was a craftsman who built idols. How many of y'all remember Rachel when they were, they were fleeing uh, from, I believe it was Laban, they were fleeing, and when they caught Rachel, what she had in her hand was, was, a, was an idol that she had hid, but it was a family idol that had been passed down. The odds are that it was passed down from Tira. The thing was when, 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 Abra, when uh, Tira got to Haran, not only did he serve multiple gods, but guess what the people served in Haran, multiple gods. And so what you may not realize is that Tira, both Tira and Abraham were very wealthy. Abraham was wealthy because of his father. His father was very wealthy, but the odds are that Tira stayed, watch this, he stayed in Haran because once he got to Haran, he found people that could feed his thriving business. Making idols. He was building a monument instead of being on a mission. And here's what I want you to know. His trade was, in, was being a craftsman selling idols. And what I need you to understand this morning is that every time that we walk in sin, how many of you know that sin always involves a trade? Oh, I wish I knew somebody. I wish somebody was here that understood this morning. You will... See, the thing about sin is, and, and his was idolatry, it doesn't matter what the sin is, whatever our sin is, it always requires us to trade something. You, you see, what, what sin does for us is it always tells us the prize, but it never tells us the price. You can have that, but it might cost you your family. It don't tell you that, bro. Come on, somebody. You can be real popular, but it's going to cost, cost you your anonymity. Come on, you can, be, you can be accepted by the world, but you might be rejected by Christ. You can be a public success, but it might cost you private victories in your home. And so let me say this to you. Sin always causes you to settle. Y'all are quiet. Sin always causes you to settle. I'm going to say it again because I want you to get it. Sin always causes you to settle. I think I'll say it again. <laughs> Thank you. Sin always causes you to settle. When I say always, what do you think I mean? Always. Whenever we sin, Whenever we settle in sin, it always causes us to miss God's best for our life. There is no sugar. You will always miss what God has for you whenever you sin, because sin always causes us to settle. We, we will settle for a living when we could have a lifetime. Y'all ain't going to say nothing. We will settle for carnality when we could have spirituality. We will settle for our will when we could have God's will. We will settle to be identified by our sexuality instead of our spirituality. We will always settle because sin always causes us to settle. But here's the thing about Tira. Notice that Tira didn't just stop in Haran. Well, while we added the duck didn't just stop in Maryland. He settled there. Oh, y'all are quiet this morning. <laughs> Which tells me something. He ain't just fall into sin. He settled in it. And see, this is what I know about sin. 
Sin will always take you further than you plan to go. It will always keep you longer than you plan to stay. It will always cost you more than you intended to pay. But I didn't come to talk to you about Abraham's father. Mm. I didn't come to talk to you about your father. I came to talk to you about the Abraham in you. Because here's the part I like about it. God spoke to Abraham according to Acts chapter 7, and God told Abraham way back in Ur, get your behind over to Canaan. I got a promise for you. Abraham went with his father to Iran. They lived there for five years. That's a long stay over. Abraham stayed there until his father died. Genesis chapter 12 goes on to tell us that God speaks to Abraham again and says, get up, leave your kindred, leave your country, leave everything and everybody you know and go to Canaan. What I know is this, that even after Abraham settled, he still got there. What I need you to understand this morning is when you look back at your life and you say, you know, I settled here, God wants you to understand, even though you settled, you can still get there. Even though you lost time, you can still get there. You can still get there, even after you settled. If you've settled as a father, you can still get there. If you've settled as a man, you can still get there. If you've settled as a Christian, you can still get there. Now, what I like about it is Tara's name means delayed. So even if you're delayed because of what your father did, you can still get there. Even if you're delayed because of what your father didn't do, you can still get there. I wish I had somebody. Who, if you're delayed even because of your own decisions, you can still get there. It doesn't matter what delays you. It doesn't even matter how long you've been delayed. God says that you can still get to what he has for your life. So then the question is, how can I get there? If I've been delayed, anybody been delayed before? Anybody, let me just, I'm curious to know, male or female, anybody could be further if your father had gone further? Mm. Anybody want your children to go further than you went? Mm. You can still get there. Look at your name and say, you can still get there. You can still get there. You can still get there. Well, let me tell you what happened. There's another reason why Tira stayed in Haran. Where he came from was a desert land. Ur was a desert. As a matter of fact, Ur is 250 miles south of uh, 250 miles south of, it's going to hit me in a minute, I can't think of it, Baghdad, Baghdad, 250 miles south of present day Baghdad. And guess what that is? Desert. So when he left Ur, it was no big deal because he was just leaving a desert place. Are you with me? He had already lo he had lost his son, his son Haran, not the place, but the son Haran had passed away. And so finally the father decides to go ahead and move when he takes Abraham and Sarah and neighbor, Nahor and his wife and, and Lot, Haran's son, and they move on. But when they get to the place Haran, Haran is not a desert place. It sits on the Euphrates River. And it is halfway between, roughly halfway between Ur and Canaan. And Haran is named after, it's sort of simple, it's sort of similar to the word caravan in spelling because it's, that's what it means, the rod of the caravan. So can you imagine moving from a desert place to a place that's sitting on a river? That's a trade route. Can you imagine how comfortable he must have been? 
Oh, I wish I had new, I wish I had somebody. He's moved from a place that everything is far away, everything is hard, everything is, is hot, and he's in a place that's not a desert place, but he's in, if you will, an oasis, a paradise. Anything that he could have wanted was convenient because it would be on the trade route. Anything that he wanted, he could have to make him comfortable because it was on the trade route. He was literally sitting in the lap of luxury. But how many I know sometimes comfort? Sometimes sitting in comfort will take you off your mission. Sometimes it's not the devil, it's comfort. Sometimes it's not even sin holding you, but it's just comfort. I, I would go God, but I'm too comfortable. I would serve God, but I'm too comfortable. I would give God, but I'm too comfortable. I would change jobs, but I'm too comfortable. I wish I had a way. Sometimes comfort doesn't work for you, it works against you. I'm going to show you all a video if they have it ready. You guys got it ready? All right, I want you to take a listen to something I showed you a few years back, see what you get out of it, we'll talk. Damage, things we use every day so regularly we don't even think about how its constant use could actually be killing us. The real culprit is the chair. We were given legs for a reason. Most third world cultures don't even have chairs and they walk an average of 10 miles a day. We in the modern world, on the other hand, spend most of our entire waking day sitting down. People go right from bed to sitting on the toilet, after which they sit at the breakfast table, then they sit in a car as they drive to work and spend the entire day sitting at a desk, only getting up to sit in the toilet and in the cafeteria. Then they sit in a car to drive and sit at the local bar for happy hour. Then when they've had enough of that, they go drive home and spend the rest of the day sitting in a comfortable chair watching TV before they crawl to bed to recover from all the physical exertion that day. And when people go out, they sit at a restaurant or a movie theater. Sitting all day is far worse for you than you might think. A 2010 American Cancer Society study following over 123,000 people from 1993 to 2016 found these alarming results. People who were inactive and sat for over six hours a day were 94% more likely to die during the time period studied than those who were physically active and sat less than three hours a day. That's almost 100%. And get this, findings were independent of physical activity levels. The negative effects of sitting were just as strong in people who exercised regularly. 60%, that's over half of employees surveyed, were convinced they would be more productive if they had the option to work on their feet. Medical experts have started referring to long periods of physical inactivity and its negative consequences as sitting disease. Below this video are links to an endless list of medical studies showing you physical cut. inactivity mm -hmm. and low fitness are serious threats. So what I want you to pull out to you is what, did you capture what they said? You'd be better off smoking. If you had to choose a chair of cigarettes, you should, according to the medical advice, you should share, choose the cigarettes. If you had to choose one of them. Y'all gonna be more excited now when they say, okay, stand up in church, sit back down, stand up. That's so frustrating, right? It says you'd be better off having a whopper than sitting. Because comfort can kill you. See, the reason why people don't shift in their relationships because they're comfortable. Y'all ain't gonna say nothing. The reason why folks don't really pray, I mean really pray, because they're comfortable. I wish I had a witness in the house. The reason why folks don't run to worship, because they're comfortable. And what I see in this story about tears is that comfort can kill you. And what you saw happen to you physically through a chair is the same thing that happens to us spiritually when we become too comfortable. It kills the fire. It kills the anointing. It kills the passion. It kills the drive. And God said, I need you to get up and start moving. Get up and get back on mission. 
Get up and get back to worship. Get up and get back to fellowship. Some of us have been sitting since the pandemic and God said, get out your chair and start moving. Get out of your comfort zone and step into your growth zone. Get up and do what I called you to do. Don't die in the barnyard. Don't die after the pandemic. Don't die spiritually because you're too comfortable. Don't let the chair keep you in the barn. In barnyard living. You know the reason you come to church every week besides the worship? That too. <laughs> the reason you come is so you can hear what matters most. Let me rewind that for you. The reason you come is so that you can be reminded of what matters most. Because in your mail, you're going to get things that matter. In your email box, your inbox, you're going to get things that matter. In your, you know, your, your inbox on, on Instagram, you'll get things that matter. But you won't get what matters most. The reason you need the word is because it matters most. And the difference between living on mission and living passionately and being fired up and having a reason to get up in the morning besides to brush your teeth and go to work. The reason is when you can live on mission, it gives you, exist, it gives you a reason to get up and do something with yourself because you, live, you have a, a greater goal of your life rather than just being comfortable. I heard somebody say, we are born, when you're born, you're born looking like your parents, but you died looking like your decisions. Should I say that again? When you're born, you're born looking like your parents. But when you die, you die looking like your decisions. This morning, I came to challenge some brothers in the house to make a decision to live on mission, to be a man on mission for God. And the only way you can do that is to exit your comfort zone. I'm going to say, the only way, because see, the thing about it was, it, it would have been easy for, for Abraham to stay. He could have stayed in Haran because his family was there. He could have stayed in Haran because his dad's business was there. He could have stayed in Haran. If you read about Abraham, he wasn't just rich. He was filthy rich. Which meant he had to move all of his cattle and all of his herds and travel another 600 miles to get to Canaan, which meant he could have been robbed. Which meant his wife could have been enslaved. But he got out of his comfort zone. And I'm talking about him today, 4,000 years later, because he got on mission for God. I don't care how long you've been off mission. I don't care what got you off mission. I'm telling you this morning, no matter what it is, whether it's delay, whether it's sin, whether it's comfort, no matter what it is, you can get back on mission for God if you're willing to get out of your comfort zone. I'm basically done. Y'all can come up. If you're willing to get out of your comfort zone, <clears throat> you can get out of mission. I heard Bishop Jake say this, and I said, ooh, this is good. He said, God doesn't do easy. Because I know when we come to Christ, I know when I did, I thought it meant my life was supposed to be easy. Hmm. If he did easy, he would never have a boy kill a Goliath, a giant, because that's not easy. If he did easy, he would never cause a barren woman to birth a prophet if he did easy. If he did easy, he would never tell a blind man to go find the pool and that, that he cannot see so that he can get his healing. God doesn't do it. If he did easy, he would never stand outside Elijah's grave and say, dead man, come alive instead of... God doesn't do easy, he does destiny. God doesn't do easy, he does divine. If it's not easy, it's probably God. If it's tough, it's probably God. If it's challenging, it's probably God. Stay there. Why? Because in the challenging times, I've got to walk by faith and not by sight. In the challenging times, I've got to lean and depend on Jesus. In the challenging times, I've got to pray with all my might. In the challenging times, my roots go deep into the rock of my salvation.
salvation is in the challenge that you find God. It's in the trial that you find God. It's in the difficult place that you find God. God is not American. He's God of all the earth. He's not interested in my comfort. He wants to use your life. He wants to give you a mission in the world. So if it hasn't been easy for you, I dare to get on your feet and stop blessing God. If you've been going through a hard place, I dare to stop thanking God that God is working in your life, that God is ordering your steps, that God is making a way out of no way, that God is doing exceedingly, abundantly, above all you can think or ask. I don't know about you, but when I get to the end on this side, I don't want to say I had an easy life. I just want to say it was worth it. As long as it could be hard, as long as it was worth it. It might get lonely, but as long as it was worth it. I might get tired sometimes, but as long as it was worth it. Man, some folk leave me, but as long as it was worth it. As long as I can get to you and say, God, you use you, you, everything in me is out of me. I'm good. It's worth it. I want to pray for you this morning. I want, I want us, and I'm going to ask all fathers and men, all men to come on down if you have your sons with you.